Welcome everybody to our first official meeting of the uh, uh, our review and and uh, enjoyment of Doreen's book, The Rebirth of Witchcraft. And we are going to do chapters one through four today. Hello, thank you, Maggie. Um, I'm reading from the book, which is in the Dory Valiente Foundation Library. And inside is a wonderful inscription from Doreen with her love to her beloved um, partner, Ron, Ron Cook. So, thank you. And it falls to me to introduce the first chapter, which is called, Why Then? So the question means, why did the rebirth of witchcraft happen at that point in history, that particular point? And it happened because Helen Duncan, who was a spiritualist, was convicted of witchcraft. And in her trial, the pertinent word was pretend. It was a prejudiced inquiry. And her trial was held on the Witchcraft Act of 1735, where pretending to hold communion with the spirits is referenced in this act. Her crime was that she predicted the sinking of HMS Barham three weeks before the event, and thus in the eyes of the authority transgressed security laws. Eventually, and she went to prison and was convicted. Eventually, with pressure from the growing spiritualist national union and sympathetic members of parliament, the Fraudulent Mediums Act 1951 became law and the Antiquated Witchcraft Act was repealed as, as a de direct result of this conviction. So to use spiritualist mediumship in a fraudulent manner was legislated against, of course, um, but the act did not do anything to apply, did not apply to anything for entertainment purposes. And it's interesting to note that later on in this chapter, Doreen refers to a Gerald quote as saying, of course I'm a witch and I get great fun out of it. Was this Gerald's way of qualifying the Fraudulent Mediums Act um, by saying he gets fun and therefore it's in entertainment? Or was he trying to dispel the stereotypical evil witch persona? Doreen sets the scene for the origins of Gardnerian Wicca, giving correct due to Cecil Williamson and his seminal part in the movement. Cecil Williamson had, um, was a bit of a backstage character, I think, with Gerald taking all the glory sometimes. But Doreen set the record straight and she gave him his dues. And the Sunday pictorial article, which was entitled Calling All Covens in 29th of July, 1951, um, heralding the opening of the Folklore Centre of Superstition and Witchcraft. Note, this was just a few months after the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, so I think they may have been planning something anyway. <laughs> um, and it's interesting to note that the centre was called the Folklore Centre of Superstition and Witchcraft, not just about witchcraft. Gerald Gardner opened it, and he was a founding member of the Southern Coven of British Witches. The brochure written by Gerald Gardner was a description of the mill in the, in the Isle of Man, and the memorial of... Uh, it didn't mention Cecil William at all in the brochure, that Cecil Williamson at all in the brochure. Um, it had a description of the mill and a memorial to the witches who suffered persecution in Western Europe, nine million of them. But Cecil Williamson, who wrote that memorial, wasn't mentioned. Later on, Gerald Gardner bought the mill from Cecil Williamson 
And then in another paragraph, Doreen introduces Gerald Gardner and his partner Daffo as part of the coven of British witches. She goes on to explain that in the 1950s, we'd just come out of World War II, picking up the pieces. And in Doreen's inimitable style, the rather dangerous idea has entered people's heads that perhaps they were entitled to have some of this liberty that they'd heard so much about. She then mentions one of her pet topics, the permissive society, and begins to herald the movement towards liberations, which was to come in the following decade, the decadent 60s. She highlights Gerald Gardner's impatience to spread the word in the media. Um, and she also highlights the reality of witchcraft doesn't pay for broken windows. The difficulty in finding good books on the occult, tarot cards, crystal balls, occult paraphernalia is also mentioned at that time. It was still very hard and not above ground, although it's slowly surfacing. The concept of feminism was introduced later in the chapter and it linked to the portentous emergence of a pagan cult, which had priestesses in her words. The Isle of Man Museum was a great success and a really good way of informing visitors about the old religion and breaking down barriers. Cecil Williamson told about the night of the 1st of August, 1940, when a certain 17 witches gathered in the new forest to raise a cone of power to prevent Hitler invading Britain. This was the article that prompted Doreen to contact Mr. Williamson and the life-changing events that followed when Cecil Williamson passed on that letter to Gerald Gardner. The paragraphs about John Simmons' biography of Crowley and the tongue-in-cheek way that Doreen describes the press notes, wickedest man, king of depravity, etc. These headlines in the style of shock, horror, almost vaudevillian in style and definitely flamboyant, reminiscent of the libertarian roaring 20s decade, preceding the dark days of the 30s depression and the 40s World War II. Do we see a pattern here being echoed in today's world? Mm. She describes the charter that Alistair Crowley had granted Gerald Gardner, signed and sealed by Alistair Crowley, giving Gerald the mandate to operate a lodge of the OTO. The charter was in the Mill Museum. And she quotes a limerick by Alistair Crowley. My name is Alistair Crowley. I'm master of magic unholy, of wand, sword and pentacle, nightshade and mandrake and moly. My magic aid, screery. Well, Gerald wasn't so good at spelling, was, was he? And uh, Doreen mentions this. Um, and in fact, I found a book also in the Foundations Library, which clearly, well, the covers clearly says Skiri there, but inside, you know, Doreen liked to, to correct things in Biro, that it belonged to her, it's her book, and she's crossed out the R. <laughs> so, okay. Can you see she's crossed it out? Okay. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story. Thank you. Love her. <laughs> so uh, towards the end of the chapter, Doreen continues with the theme, almost saying it, but not quite, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the new El El Elizabethan era. She softens a bit towards Crowley, giving his rituals and followers credence, new and exciting the definition of magic with a CK, is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. 
no longer about superstition, but relevant and relatable to present day. She concludes the three factors concurred in 1951 to answer the question, why now, why at this time, were the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, the opening of the witch's mill in Castle Town, and the publication of The Great Beast by John Simmons, the, the book about Alistair Crowley. So that's my conclusion. <laughs> Masterfully done, Julie, thank you. Thank you. I, I did wanna throw in that uh, it, it went through my social media feed a couple of days ago that the witch's mill is for sale. <laughs> yes. I so uh, you guys wanna buy some property together and like run off and- uh... <laughs> Wow. Oh, yeah. oh, so someone will certainly buy it and yes. transform it oh, in yeah. something super. Well, it's, it's been converted into uh, homes apparently. Yeah, so, so it's, it's um, made, been made residential, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So it's for so, sale and it's a bunch of flats now. It's something like that. Something yeah. to that effect, yeah. Oh. It, the, the small list, the small article I found about it wasn't terribly explicit, but I still think it would make a lovely place for us to all, you know, mm. get up to nefarious no goods. Shenanigans <laughs> is what we call them, yes. <laughs> that would be fantastic a training center <laughs> yes book club oh, headquarters come li on library library, library <laughs> the best idea wouldn't it yes <laughs> but yeah. that's just fantastic julie um do Thank folks you. want to comment i mean i think this is a good time to to interject any thoughts uh or we can keep going yeah any questions I, I'm I'm just in love with Julie's visual aids of the uh, the two books that you held up, Julie. That's just thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. I'm glad I have them here because the rest of the library is in England. That's uh, that makes it so meaningful to have that yeah. personal connection. And I just adore the fact that Dorian corrected the spelling in the book. That's <laughs> justice right there. Um, I can't say that my visual aids are going to be nearly as interesting for chapter two, but I'll go ahead if that's all right. Yes, I know that we're, we're uh, pressed for time. Is it okay if I share my screen just for the purposes yes. of the share screen? Um, can you do that anyway? I can, and I, I just wanted to warn people before I did that so you could be prepared. I'll just mute myself. That's great. Um, this is my Kindle copy of The Rebirth of Witchcraft, and I, I'm just using this as my notes because it will give me a way to follow through as I talk about the chapter. Um, I'm going to invite people to just interrupt me at any time. It's a small group, and if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them in context. So um, chapter two discusses some of the most important influences that Doreen noted on the craft. She doesn't do a lot of um, critical analysis, although there are a couple places where she does, and I think that's notable. Um, but the people that she thinks of as the forerunners of the craft are noted here in this place. Uh, she doesn't give a number of them, but many are mentioned within the chapter. And I would say even the ones that are of less um, like historical importance are more interesting to me. So I'm just going to talk about each of them in turn. The first one she mentions is Charles Godfrey Leland. Leland wrote um, the book uh, Aradia, the Gospel of the Witches. And we did that as a book club during the pandemic. So I have lots of thoughts on that and we're not gonna have time to get into any of them, but if anybody wants to hit me up for more of them, feel free to do that. Um, Leland is fascinating. There is so much to learn about him. And I did not know that he was in the Battle of Gettysburg. That is really fascinating. Um, mm. The fact that he uh, has this wealth of historical experience and folkloric knowledge make me feel like he is sort of a contemporary to Gardner in that way. Like they both have a lot of that same spirit, uh, even though they were at different in different eras. Um, so Leyland, mm. Uh, in the context of this chapter is mostly notable for his last book, uh, which was published kind of in his last couple years when he was alive. 
And, but his other ones that are mentioned here are worth reading as well, especially uh, Etruscan Roman remains. Um, and they sort of go together. If you're going to read Aradia, uh, I would recommend reading both of them together. So she talks a little bit about how Leland met with a woman whom he names Madalena, and then later on uh, changes her name that we find out who she really was, but she's named here as Madalena, and that she was a witch, an Italian witch. Um, and he describes her as potentially a gypsy, um, which I know is a, is a, um, as a slur, and I would not choose to use that name now. Uh, and she specifically says that she was, she was a witch. Um, and I think that whether or not this document that Leland wrote was uh, relevant, uh, I mean, it, it definitely relevant, whether it was true is, is not pertinent here. Um, but he certainly treated it such. And uh, his niece who wrote his biography talks about how important his relationship was with this person, even though he only met her briefly and that he, I think the affection that he had for her and the information that she had and the description of her experience as a witch was really important to him. So I don't have a lot here about Leland um, because the details are, um, are scattered throughout here and some of them are true and some of them are, are erroneous. So I won't get into detail there, but um, I think it's interesting that uh, Doreen chooses to mention this quote, the God of the old religion becomes the devil of the new. This mm -hmm. is uh, a, a quote from Margaret Murray um, and she mentions her later. And the description of Lucifer as um, a representation of the, the God of the witches, which in this case she would name as Pan and more generally the male element in nature, the horned God um, and related to the principles of fire, the sun and the phallus. And then she mentions the principles of light and darkness and how those relate to the I Ching or potentially the Kabbalistic tree of life which you know, are described in Doreen's writings several times. Um, she says the most important thing out of this passage is the fact that Diana is named as the goddess of the witches instead of Satan as is thought by some people. And that was confirmed by Margaret Murray's writings as well. Again, she talks about how Murray's writings were discredited later and certainly even at that time were under suspicion by her, um, her academic colleagues. But again, not relevant because those, this is the, really the way that the witchcraft religion as we practice it today uh, was impacted. And that the deity of the witches, uh, she talks about also that the naming of the fixed festivals, um, the cross quarter days um, uh, I, is, is important that it was named in both of those documents as, as being the, the celebratory. So um, Murray doesn't talk about um, the other holidays and Leland doesn't talk about those holidays, but only talks about the the um, the ones that he, the ones that we meet on the full moon, and then Murray names those espots and says they don't have to be on the full moon, but could be on any important day. So there's some there's some conflicting information there, but I think that she's trying to mention that there are two times when witches traditionally meet, and those are centered around the cyclical solar holidays and also around the times of the moon. So um, she mentions the um, idea of the 
man in a ritual disguise as described in Murray's God of the Witches um, as being sort of the uh, scary sacrificial character um, who is really a man in a costume. And that I think it is interesting here where she, I'll read this part because I like her words. Um, it is notable in this connection that the Romans, um, the Roman Egyptian gypsy word for God is devil or duvel, according to the gypsy expert, George Barrow, who compares it with the Sanskrit diva, meaning God, and uh, makes that connection that that word may have been a, com uh, a complicating factor, uh, but I don't think that that was actually in the text. I think that that's an interesting point. Uh, she also mentions James Frazier's book, The Golden Bough, multiple document, many, many book um, uh, series, but only touches on it as being uh, a connection point. I would definitely say that he was of importance to the early formation of the craft. She mentions um, a Masonic writer who makes a connection to um, a figure in Masonic ritual, which she doesn't go into any detail about, but I'm kind of intrigued. She talks a little bit about Robert Graves and his poetic work, The White Goddess, and how important that was to people's understanding and um, sort of conception of the early craft. One of the things that comes up in her description of the, of the white goddess is um, a reference to an earlier Scottish witch trial and a connection between the witch goddess and the queen of Elfin, which in this case is spelled particularly this way, but I think uh, is meant to be the queen of fairy or the queen of Elfame. And as described in this particular witch trial uh, of 1597, which I have referenced here, I don't know if my, it's gonna come up as, um, the, the trial, as the, um, the transcript provided by Andrew Mann um, about his experiences of the witch goddess, or I mean, as much as we can trust any kind of witch, uh, witch trial um, information but that she is described as being like um, empowered, um, can be any age. Uh, she makes any king, I think that's a quote from Shakespeare, but that I love that Doreen latches onto that as, um, as justification for the witch cult being led by women. And she says, this is in fact, the description of the free independent woman so detested by patriarchal morality throughout the ages, right back to the Sumerian goddess Lilith, who became in Jewish legend the she-devil who was the first wife of Adam and left him because she refused to obey him. It is not the liberated woman because women had not yet been enslaved. And, uh, and I, I, I resonate with Doreen's uh, connection to the witch goddess in that way. And uh, she doesn't talk a lot about Graves' uh, historical accuracy. Again, you know, we know now that, that it's really a poetic myth and, and not very accurate, but very interesting for sure. Um, and then she also talks about Dion Fortune and the importance of Dion Fortune's uh, impact on the craft, not only as an occultist, but also as a fiction writer. Um, her fiction is directly connected to her works on the tree of life and, um, and follows the, the path of the tree in a very interesting way. Um, and the idea that, that like her, her importance resonates throughout the craft, even now from this self-published book she couldn't get anybody else to publish, I think is really important here. Um, she mentions Alan Richardson's books. Uh, Alan Richardson's written a lot about Dion Fortune. Um, and there's a particular book called Dancers to the Gods, which goes into detail 
about how an occult lodge was practiced at this time. Um, I think it's really an important read. Um, I love this quote from Doreen where she says, um, in my early days as a student of the occult, I rendered myself persona non grata to a theosophical group by asking why they were all masters of, um, you know, that these are connections to, to ancestors. Um, and why weren't there any mistresses? And I regret that I have never yet received a satisfactory answer to this question, although I find it hard to believe that sexism exists upon the inner planes. I love her snarkiness there. Um, I'm running out of time here, but I will mention that um, one of the people that I don't know very much about, as she's mentioned in here, is uh, CRF Seymour and his writings as uh, about his as essays as published in The Forgotten Mage and also in an earlier essay uh, called The Old Religion, A Study in the Symbolism of the Moon Mysteries, which is on order, but I have not read it yet. Um, and Basil Wilby is, uh, is that's just a, a pseudonym for Gareth Knight. He, uh, his, um, his early writings on, on occultism, uh, she lauds here and I don't know anything about him. So I think that's really important that I go back and read them. She says that they are required reading for everyone today who professes to be a witch or a pagan. Um, and more about Alan Richardson and his description of nature worship in general. Um, and I will say that all of this is beautiful um, and evocative in a way that transcends like historical accuracy. And I read Doreen in that, in that lens. I don't really need her to be correct in order to get what I get out of her writing. Um, and her, her belief that this confluence of events as described in chapter one has brought all of these people together to create the conditions for the craft to be reborn, I think is really important. And it would behoove us to read all of these things with an eye to any detail that we may have missed. Woo. Good Lots stuff. Of. Good stuff. I like what you said about that sort of confluence of people coming together. And uh, I think that's something that's missing presently. There's a lot of new people coming into various forms of witchcraft. And it's all very based on the now there's no um, observance of any kind of foundation or history. Yeah. Heritage. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's, that's my biggest bugaboo sort of bone of contention with sort of TikTok witches and, and popular culture witchcraft right now is that it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not claiming to be seeded by anything. It's just kind of uh, frantic and, and ungrounded. So interesting. Thank you for that. It's easy to dismiss the early foundations of the craft as being unimportant if we find something that's inaccurate. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I mean, there's layers in there and I, I would hate to miss something just because we're like, oh, that was wrong. So all of it must be wrong or not important. So uh, I, I keep coming back to it even now. And um, I learn things every time I read. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And um, if we lose the memory of the birth of the rebirth, <laughs> the birth of the rebirth of witchcraft, well, um, obviously we won't be able to appreciate why Wicca, Wicca exists. And yeah, we're all, everyone is good to create a new witchcraft system. It's that easy but it's unnecessary really, because it all goes back to the rebirth of witchcraft. It, we, we don't need to rebirth anything else really. We just need to study our origin, don't we? No, but I think, I think you're absolutely right, Maggie. It's easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater when we read objectionable things in old books, you know, um, gypsies and red Indians in chapter two, uh, right. you know, that's, that's hard. That's hard to read over. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, I, I've got some notes about this in, in chap my debrief for chapter three is that, you know, while she's very good about uh, pointing out certain kinds of racism and obviously sexism, she also commits some of those things in her writing too, right? Mm -hmm. So very much a product of where society was at at that time. And we need to remember the context, right? So. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I would I, be really curious to know if anybody has done a chart for the rebirth of witchcraft in that I'm sure people have. I would really love to, to dig in a little bit to that. One thing I noticed as well is that even though some things now may have been discounted or inappropriate at the time, they are what sort of went into the people who made us what we are. So we can't discount them. We just can't. They are a vital part. And yes, we can get to the point where we can say, well, actually, no, that's that's not very right. That Or, you know, the, the, very controversial, wouldn't have that these days, but it goes to make up where we started and so for that alone it has to be it has to be sort of credited in that aspect mm. Dodie yeah. are you on for chapter three yeah sure so uh you know here's where we start meeting uh Gerald more intimately um a little bit of a uh a spoiler throughout this whole reoccurring theme of her uh, criticizing sexism within occult communities. And uh, that absolutely happens. And she brings it back to uh, uh, a, a couple of times in this chapter. Um, she also starts, I love the way throughout the, the, the book, she's, and especially ju very juicily in the, the, these introductory chapters where she's, she's dropping the names of books that are important. You know, like this is, she's really seeding, um, seeding the, the sort of the, the mood with all these great clues and hints and pointers about just like where to go for more information, you know, based on the information that is available at that time. So that's really exciting. Um, when she's talking about, um, she talks a bit about, about sexism and I wanna find the passage. Uh, she says uh, just on, on page 35 in my edition, uh, information on the subject, she's talking about spiritualism and theosophy, was however, very hard to come by. Those who knew anything about it would not only refuse to help an outsider, especially a woman, I found that they would actively hinder one's quest if they could. I found Dion Fortune's remark in her book, The Mystical Kabbalah, to be only too true, namely that present day initiates had put all the knowledge into a secret box and then sat on the lid. And I'm like, wow, when are we gonna stop doing that to each other? Hmm. So, you know, it, it, it foreshadowing forever, I think with that one. Um, you know, I, I, I read an interest about how she, uh, her, uh, her interest in Crowley, I mean, that comes up throughout. She again uh, refers to the John Simmons uh, biography and how she read it with close attention. And I've never had much patience for reading Crowley stuff, but you know, whenever, whenever I think about that, I'm like, maybe I should give it a second chance for the millionth time, a second chance. Uh, yeah, again, and I, I did, I think I've got in my notes here a couple of times, you know, books that she's mentioned and the fact that she, she keeps coming back to certain books, uh, Magic and Theory and Practice by Crowley being one of them and the John Simmons book being another. Um, I love her account of, uh, you know, when she finally started to tap the kind of materials she wanted to read. She says, I shall never forget how I rode home on the bus glowing with triumph. I remember looking at the sunset clouds in their glory and knowing somehow that I was destined for a career in magic. And I just love the idea of her sitting on the bus thinking like that. You know, I, I know I've had moments where I've, I've, I've been just feeling, just feeling that you've tapped the current and that you're on the right path and that the, you can see sort of a roadway unfolding in front of you. Love it. Um, despite some of the, the prejudiced and, and somewhat racist things and somewhat sometimes overtly racist things that she 
you accent, you know, I'm sure she wasn't trying to be a racist when she was writing some of that stuff, but uh, she does write about her own experiences being on the receiving end of racism. And I thought that that was poignant. Um, she talks about her husband being a, a refugee from the Spanish Civil War and that uh, as such, he was receiving a great deal of racism in, in living in, in, with her in Bournemouth at the time. And she writes, uh, my husband was a refugee from the Spanish Civil War who had gone on to fight with the Free French Forces against Hitler. He had been badly wounded at the Battle of Narvik and allowed to leave the forces and take a civilian job. I had met and married him during the war and we went to Bournemouth where he worked as a chef. In spite of his war record, he was regarded as a foreigner and therefore a lower form of life. So was I for having married him. This gave me what I suppose is a valuable experience of knowing what it is like to be on the receiving end of racism. Um, I, I, it's almost like we're seeing her open her eyes and certainly throughout her career as a witch, she, she was, no, there's been a couple of moments where she's been noted to have spoken um, out against things that she'd previously endorsed. Uh, yeah, there was the uh, recently circulated on one of the, uh, the, the, the forums I'm a part of, a uh, transcription of her Pagan Federation lecture that she gave in, I think, 1989, where she said, yeah, I, I don't think gay people are a problem in the craft. I, you know, I, I once thought it was wrong, but now I, I, you know, who am I to judge kind of thing. And, you know, I love that she was able to to say these things and change her mind and eat a bit of humble pie, but do it with grace and tact and elegance. And well, couldn't we all learn a little bit from that? Anyway, um, moving along. Um, so there's you know, the sexism and racism pieces where I found particularly poignant. Um, then she, she goes on to write about her experience uh, of writing to Cecil Williamson and that letter leading to her meeting with uh, Gerald and I love, I love how she describes um, that meeting, going to Daffo's house and meeting with Gerald Gardner, and how she describes Daffo. And it's it's a, a very strong reminder of how sort of privileged and middle class a lot of the people who who were uh, who were writing books and that we know of were practicing witchcraft in the time. This this wasn't a bunch of, you know, ignorant peasants you know, in, on hill, you know, somewhere out in, in rural areas. These are, you know, pretty established and, and privileged folks. Um, and I love how she says, uh, thus it was that one sunny afternoon as autumn was fading into winter in 1952, I found myself in Daffo's pleasant, well-appointed house, shaking hands with a tall white haired man who rose to greet me as I entered the drawing room. We seemed to take an immediate liking to each other. I realized that this man was no time-wasting pretender to occult knowledge. He was something different from the kind of people I had met in esoteric gatherings before. One felt that he had seen far horizons and encountered strange things, and yet there was a sense of humor about him and a youthfulness in spite of his silver hair. Um, I like that. And, you know, talking about, you know, how Daffo had, was a, uh, a teacher of music and elocution, you know, very, sort of proper sounding people. And uh, I love that. I mean, my first encounters with real witches was nothing like that. It was, you know, quite the opposite, in fact. Um, Daffo is described as an elegant, graceful lady with dark wavy hair. In her younger days, as I later discovered, she had been one of the people who had helped to found the Rosicrucian Theater in Christchurch. You know, again, you know, talented, graceful, lovely Daffo. It's, it's, it's a beautiful image. Um, so that meeting, you know, it sounds just like a really pleasant tea party and look what it led to, you know, it, that, I love that. Um, she goes on to write about um, uh, proving the existence of old Dorothy Clutterbuck, which is uh, a fascinating thing. Um, love, I love those stories. I love that, that mythology. I love that mystery. I think it's a, a fascinating part of, of witchcraft history and folklore. Um, 
she uh, she she goes on quite a bit about about that meeting in Daffo's drawing room, and I, I I feel like I was there when I when I read about the the things they talked about and and how they sat in that room together. Um, <laughs> I like how she said she says. Of course, I knew nothing about this as I sat in the sunny late autumn afternoon taking tea in Daffo's drawing room and trying to weigh up the situation I found myself in. Were these really the people whose forerunners had been burned at the stake? Did they go in for the sort of thing I'd read about in the novels by Dennis Wheatley, where a materialization of Satan himself presided over a blood-stained altar? You know, it's it, she almost sounds disappointed that these people are just so so gentle and, and, and reasonable. Um, and I, I like how she goes on to describe uh, that as she was leaving, Gerald gave her a copy of High Magic's Aid to read and uh, how this, this was probably his way of sort of filtering out people who might be squeamish about, you know, the actual practices that were being conducted by the group. Um, and again, she, she says, you know, maybe this was a this is not the sensational version of the story where, you know, people were being lured. It was like she was being warned and given plenty of opportunity to walk away if she wanted to. Um, I, I also find it, she writes about Gerald so lovingly and, you know, their, their relationship all, all, wasn't always very loving. And even when she talks about how she um, sort of, after his death, went and checked his claims for his uh, his status of doctor of literature and doctor of philosophy. Um, even when she's saying that it was rubbish, she's doing it in a very kind way and trying to think of ways that he could have taken those titles because they were bestowed in sort of an affectionate way by others. You know, she's very uh, forgiving, let's say, of, of his uh, his sort of eccentricity that way. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. A um, couple other things that I'm, and I, I don't want to go on forever here. I, I could, but I don't want to. Um, she writes about his death also. You know, she writes about his life and what's what, what sort of a bit of an imp that he was. Um, I like how she uh, refers to him, uh, tells the story about, uh, about the merry devil. Uh, I'm irresistibly reminded of a circus performer called Walford Bodie who used to dazzle audiences back in the days when I was a child with amazing and spectacular electrical tricks. He appeared in an immaculate evening dress and was usually addressed as Dr. Walford Bodie. He sported his name, he sported after his name the initials MD. When asked what they stood for, he would reply, Merry Devil. And I'm like, ah, okay. So sometimes it's a joke. Gerald was certainly a merry old devil, but the MA stood for magical adept. Um, a, a nice cover story for <laughs> false credentials, I think. Um, she writes about his death in a very sad way. I like the way she, she's constantly adding in the names of people who did significant things, giving a lot of credit throughout, throughout these chapters where credit's due, giving credit to Eleanor Bone for making sure his bones got salvaged and reinterred. Um, I think that's important. Um, again, she writes about uh, Operation Cone of Power on page 45 or so. Um, just a nice little piece of history. And anytime I can read about Operation Cone of Power, I get quite excited. Um, very, very uh, sort of inspiring, especially in the times we're living in, to know that uh, witches have been political activists and fighters for justice since at least the rebirth of witchcraft, <laughs> at least. Um, really appreciated back when I very, very first read this book many years ago that uh, she clarifies the meanings very clearly of Jeschel and Wittershins, because that was something that those strange words that I'd only ever heard in witchcraft circles were, were only ever written down and nobody actually ever seemed to say them out loud. So I remember back in the day reading that and thinking, oh, okay, now I've got this straight. So again, little nuggets of really good knowledge and uh, practical information being very matter of factly doled out just, just in the course of telling the story. And I like learning that way. 
And then she concludes the, um, the chapter uh, talking a bit about referring a little bit in a, again in a very conversational way to the concept of reincarnation you know such a uh, a strong theme and tenet throughout modern wicca uh she says uh one odd thing happened to me she's speaking about her initiation as i stripped off my clothes for the ritual some instinct told me to keep on the necklace i was wearing i found subsequently that this was correct wear for a witch priestess a fact quite unknown to me at the time. Had I done something like this before? Um, I love that. Just a casual reference to some sort of reincarnation, past life memory that uh, sort of reinforces the fact to me that she was very authentically practicing uh, this witchcraft and that it was a very uh, integrated part of her life, so. A lovely chapter, lots of very nice conversation about uh, about Gerald. I appreciated it. Um, yeah, I think that covers any notes I wanted to make. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Thank you very much for that. I think the affection with which she talks about Gerald, even in the moments when she's, as you said, uh, um, making it clear that some of it is rubbish, uh, feels very familiar to me in the way that I was taught in the craft. It's like my experience of sitting and talking about my craft elders felt a lot like this. Um, there's no veneration here. It's just like, it's very personal. Yeah. And uh, we don't have, you know, we're not trying to make them more than they were. He was not a saint, you know, he was not perfect in any way and we wouldn't expect him to be, um, but that we have a connection there and that it's meaningful. Well, I, 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 could, I could rant about that one for a long time because it's so important. You know, there's, there's that, that humility there, you know, where we're, we're not putting anybody up. We shouldn't, it, it's an example of why we shouldn't be putting anybody up on a pedestal right you know um that sometimes the sometimes as priesthood we have to sort of bow down low and kind of do what needs to be done and do the right thing and admit when we're wrong and change our minds when better information comes along it's it's all there it's all coded in these chapters yes and absolutely anybody who refuses to do that or can't see that needs to get back to back to the books and do some thinking i think And then we have a, a one more chapter and I know that you at some point have to dash off Dodie. So just go when you need to go. I will. I, I'm going to have to, but yeah, uh, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Thank you um, so much for that. Marco, I believe you're next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted just to reassure Dodie. I'm, I'm sure it's unnecessary, but I wrote uh, the things I'm going to I'm going to say now. I wrote them in the form of a bullet point uh, so I can share that and, and put it somewhere. Thank you. It's not. It's not uh, essential, but uh, just just for you to not miss on anything. Um, I well, I think chapter four is really um, the continuation of chapter three. It goes a little bit. Uh, it takes the narrative of of Gerald Garner um, further. Um, so uh, Doreen uh, speaks about well. She most of all what she's trying to do at the beginning. She's trying to uh, put. Uh, the coven, Gerald's coven in a, on a timeline and I love how always uh, she's always very inquisitive and very uh, uh, research um, research linked so she she uses this article by Peter Hawkins entitled Black Magic from 1951 to try and, and establish that well she uses that as a as a terminus antequem. So she says, well, a coven was acting, was performing at some point in 1951. So maybe the coven was active uh, back then because um, she mentions a, a group of nude devotees of both sexes uh, performing uh, rites nearby um, a nudist camp. Um, 
uh, and 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 sorry, the, this was um, the paper was from fifty one, but the ritual uh, dates back from uh, nineteen forty. Uh, I'm getting confused. This is one of the of the mentions she gave about chronology, but then she mentions again another ritual which took place in nineteen forty nine. Um, with with a few people attending. So again, what she's trying to do is she's trying to uh, date back something that she was part of only from 1950 uh, to 53, really. Um, she then goes uh, and speak about gods. Um, she's trying to, and she gives us very important information there. She says, what were the names of the gods worshipped in, in the coven that she found, that she met for the first time? So she mentions, um, she mentions uh, Janicot and uh, Aradia and Kernunnos. Uh, something she does, though, um, which is interesting, is when she mentions the ritual which took place in 1949, she describes it, she understands it as a, as a ceremonial ritual performed by Gerald Garner and other people. So that's interesting because it's, it's like she's saying, well, uh, Wicca must have arose just after that because in 1949, Gerald was still doing something which didn't look like Wicca. At least this is the, the perception I got from what she was saying. Anyway, um, yeah, she speaks. She speaks about um, uh, uh, the um, the gods. She gives us some names, and she uh, shows how she does her research. She goes on with her research, trying to understand why those names are not others. Um, she does some research onto. I think this is the first time someone um, inquired about the word "book of shadows." Uh, obviously, now we know that uh, um, Ronald Hutton did more research on that. But uh, I've always found this this little piece very interesting because she uh, establishes the origin of the the term a "book of shadows." Um, it's very interesting, and and and, and I, what I like is that it's something that she says. She says, even if this is not a genuine old witchcraft name for a book. And even if probably books were not used in old witchcraft, because at the moment she's still obviously convinced that there is a, 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 a continuation from the Middle Ages up to now in witchcraft. She says, it doesn't matter if it's old or not, it works. It's a lovely name. So I think this is very important because she's restating, she, she's declaring of about something about the validity of Wicca and witchcraft against any necessity of constantly sort of confirming historical facts. Because witchcraft is not just about history, isn't it? It's about practice. And when we practice, we know what works and what doesn't. Um, she... Uh, in fact, actually, she, uh, she wrote down a very interesting um, statement. No one with any sense would claim or ever has claimed that the witch rites of today are the unaltered rituals of our remotest ancestors. In this case, she's saying, well, the, the medieval witches of who we believe we descend from, uh, and we're not saying that they're directly connected with prehistory. Now we would say the same for every other chronology, but it's interesting that she is declaring that because she's saying it doesn't matter though. We, it, what we do, it, it's very relevant anyway. Um, she then passes to question uh, what is um, actually contained in the Book of Shadows. Um, and she questions what is, what can be considered the original production of Gerald and what and what really might even belong to the new Forest Coven. Uh, so she, she starts a little bit of research on that. Um, she mentions, for example, the fact that the word Book of Shadow didn't appear in High Magic Said. Uh, so she's, she's trying to distinguish. Also, I think she's giving us a little... Um, 
pre-description of why she reviewed the rituals for Gerald. And it is because she realized that a lot of, a great deal of Gerald's Book of Shadow uh, was uh, sort of inspired by other sources. Some of them she didn't like, really. Um, so, so in fact, she mentions the fact, um, actually something important I think in, at this point is that she mentions the fact that she contributed to um, the Farrer's publication, um, the Witch's Bible, which at the time was quite controversial, of course, because it was perceived as giving away the, some sort of secrets um, and mysteries, but she sort of uh, restate the fact that she, she is quite proud of what she's, she did because um, she sort of underlined what secrecy means in reality nowadays in modern witchcraft and, uh, um, and the fact that um, clarity was needed more than, than anything else. Um, so she, uh, she mentions all the sources that she identified. So she mentions Crowley, uh, Kipling, she mentions uh, the key of Solomon and the contributions of uh, Freemasonry reminding that both Gardner and Darfo were Freemasons. And so it just makes sense that we find um, elements of this in, in our practice. Um, she obviously quite proudly, she mentions the charge of the goddess, explaining that it was there since the beginning. So it was an element that Gardner passed by but she says that obviously the um it was evident how it was drawn by uh, the work of Leland and the work of uh, uh, um, Alistair Crowley so she had to um to modify she she felt that she needed to modify it mostly because uh, of the um you know the public opinion of of Crowley um, she uh, feels the need of distinguishing the, uh, the, um, the Book of Shadow from which she originally copied her practice uh, and, and the Book of Shadow of Shadows she heard about. I'm not sure she ever read it, I don't know, but uh, Ye Book of Ye Art Magical, which is <clears throat> the last one that... Um, was produced and if i'm not if i'm not wrong it's it's the one in the canadian um collection uh from a collection point of view i like this this bit because obviously she states this this book this first draft from which i copied it's in my collection so it's a very uh, nice um reference to to our material uh objects and um so yeah she she go further to describe how why all these crowleyan influences there she describes why Gardner and crowley um uh, knew each other's and she explains how arnold crowther introduced them to uh, to each other uh, i like this bit because it speaks about her relationships as well her friendships um her her friendship with patricia crowther and and her husband it, it sort of brings you really back there and 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 let you understand who she was seeing and how she was feeling about these people um at la at, uh, at last she mentions ritual nudity and she explained it's like um i think she's trying to normalize two aspects ritual nudity and uh, flagellation which were <clears throat> obviously probably the most controversial parts of of the craft back then um she tries to normalize uh, to normalize them saying that she was not completely convinced about them at the beginning but then with the practice she understood the meaning of it she she was not she was not um she didn't have anything against ritual nudity uh, but she was a little bit um unsure about flagellation 
but after trying flagellation in, in the practice and understanding why it was needed, uh, she suggests that she understood um, why it was used. Um, obviously, she concludes the chapter with uh, the most lovely uh, words. So she reports um, her um, version of the charge of the goddess, which she uh, produced uh, in the first instance, um, not in prose, but uh, in, in verses. And this is something that I, I don't know in your practice, but this version of the charge, it's not very commonly used. I've never, actually, I've never witnessed a ritual before uh, with this version of the charge. And uh, so I was happy to just to read it in, in this version. This is me, I think. Thank you. Is that it, Marco? Yes. Yes. Oh, lovely. Oh. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Brilliant. Okay. Alison, uh, is Alison still there? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, I must admit, I also was really excited when I saw that she included that version of the charge because I had never heard of it before and I'd certainly never seen it. And so to read it, and to compare it to um, Gardner's version and to the version that we use now was really quite exciting for me. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I, I love that, um, the poetic version of the charge and I think it can be used to great effect. Um, uh, and I, I, it's not one that I see as often um, addressed when we talk about her about Dorian's work. Um, it's it's really interesting to look at how much she's influenced this particular poem. Mm. Yes. Well, our next meeting is on August the 6th, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So I I won't we won't prolong it because Maggie's ill. Um, she needs to go to bed, I think. <laughs> I appreciate everybody being willing to meet on a, on a yeah. holiday weekend. At least it's a holiday here in the States, although I, yes. I don't think uh, I'll be oh, holiday yes, much. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay in and, and be safe. Yes, get well soon, Maggie. Thank, Thank you so you much. Everyone. Thank See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.